to experience the Asbury Revival, and I want to share how that went and pass on a few takeaways regarding the national conversation around it, and by the end, I think we'll all have a way forward with this. I was able to be there within the first week of it starting. A friend happened to text me and ask me if I had heard about it, and I hadn't. And according to him, you know, worship had started and not stopped. In my mind, as soon as he said that, I went to remembering a pretty famous revival that happened there back in 1970. I thought if this is like that, I should take advantage of the fact that I'm only a three-hour drive from Willie Moore, Kentucky. So uh, myself and some One Life staff people drove over first thing on a Monday morning. So we walked up to Hughes at Auditorium and we were there at a time when the lines weren't quite like they were, but a guy did greet us at the front and said, hey, we don't have any room on the uh, ground floor. You'll need to make your way up to the balcony. So as we're walking up to the balcony, uh, we could hear people singing in there. They were singing Do Lord, by the way, which I haven't heard since about 1978. So that was kind of a neat little refreshing thing. When we get up in the balcony and we're looking around for our seats, which is a hard thing to do. You can't find a seat. We finally find our seats, and as soon as we did, the music stopped and everybody sat down. It was like this Mr. Bean moment, right? So I am like, did we just do that? So we're sitting there, and then they start introducing the speaker, which I thought it was 24-7 worship, so I thought they, they're having a speaker. That was kind of strange. But a, a speaker comes up and teaches from Romans chapter 13 about how Christians should relate to the government. It was a good message. But it didn't feel very revivaly, kind of the stereotype in my mind. Come on, praise him. Praise him, praise him, praise him. It, it was fine, and then she got through with that, and uh, a guy steps up and says, well, that concludes our service for the day. And he said, anybody is welcome to stay around. About 20% left, and the rest stayed, and the worship team came back up and began to sing worship songs, one song after the other. And that became kind of a thing that I would describe as really, really cool. It was, it was very chill, it was very laid back. I sat a lot of the time, stood up after a while. and But then there was kind of this inner dialogue I started getting into, and I can't say for sure that it was the Lord, but I think it may have been. You know, the Lord felt like he was prompting me and reminding me of a passage that says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Because I thought, well, am I here just to be an observer and just kind of check things out, give my approval? Or if this is a historic thing, maybe I should press in a little more. And I noticed that people were at the front uh, just praying. You know, they were on their knees and they were praying very earnestly. And I kept feeling kind of torn, like maybe I should be down there. So finally, after a while, and I resisted it for a while, but I finally made my way down in the front. And I got down on my knees. And I just started praying, just doing the deal. And then I felt this hand on my shoulder, you know, God? Uh, no, it wasn't that. I, I actually thought it was a friend of mine, but then I heard this voice talking to me and praying that it wasn't a friend of mine. It was a, I could tell it was an older man, but bless his heart, he started praying for me, just that I'd be blessed and I'd be healed and I've dealt with some health issues and stuff, and, and bless him and bless him and bless him, and it was pretty awesome. And he gave me this big hug from behind and left. I never did even look to see who it was. I don't know to this day. If you're out there, thank you very much. Because then right after that, uh, they started playing this song that means a whole lot to me. And it was, all my life you have been faithful. And then I started getting these pictures in my mind of God's faithfulness to me through the years. And it was really super touching. It wasn't really overly dramatic or anything, but it was a very refreshing time. And then I got up off my knees and I had to go upstairs and tell my friends, hey, we gotta go, I got a meeting, I'm gonna have to be back. So as we walked out of the building, um, we debriefed a little bit, and one thing that did happen that was kind of cool, that, so there were four of us, and I'll kind of give one girl's name Sue and the other name Sally, and Sue said, well, the thing I got out of it was during worship was very cool, but I kept feeling like I needed to pray for Sally because on the way over there, Sally had told us about a shoulder pain that she had been having that had come back after having had surgery years ago and she was scared. And Sue just said, hey, I felt like I needed to pray for her. So I did, and, and then at that point, Sally, as we're walking away from Hughes Auditorium, said, yeah, and the pain went away, and it's kind of freaking me out. Maybe you've heard about healings happening at the revival, which I think is very, very appropriate. Well, we think we had one. We're still watching for the long-term effects and all that, but that was a kind of an extra cool bonus track for
for the whole thing. Now that was my experience. I was honestly glad I got in early because within the next few days, there were like three hour lines to get in and the national conversation about this thing exploded. And predictably, there are camps that divided up in both the pro and the con. Now what do you do with that? Well, let me pass on a few things from my experience there and my understanding of the Bible and watching the conversation happen. Now, the very first thing we need to say is it's absolutely good to ask questions and feel free to even be skeptical about things like this. The Bible says to test things. We're not required to believe everything that claims to be from God. I love this line from 1 Thessalonians. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. Now this is talking about those claiming to speak for God, but I think it can be applied more broadly. This is a great balance between being open as a posture, but also discerning. Don't treat these claims with automatic contempt, but also feel free to evaluate. So I went to Asbury with a genuine open mind, open heart. I tried to be prepared for anything. Uh, my prayer was something like, you know, hey Lord, if this is you and you're doing something, let me in on it. If it's not, I don't have to feel guilty about testing and finding uh, it doesn't pass the test. And that's a very freeing thing that we all need to remember. I'm also not required to call it a revival. The name revival is not actually a Bible word. It's a name we give to special times and places where God seems to move in more obvious and discernible way. And when you read the Bible, you can see times like this, like the dedication of the temple in the Old Testament, the day of Pentecost, Paul's visit to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. And throughout history, there have been real occurrences of this kind, which are you know revolutionary and history making. In America, we have the first and second great awakenings. Some say there was a third awakening called the Layman's Revival, which started in New York City in 1857. Look it up. I agree with what I heard a leader from Asbury say. He said, we don't know what this is. Only time will tell if it's an actual revival in the historic sense. Right now we don't know enough. We don't know what the long-term fruit of it all is. We don't have a lot of insider information, but we're free to be in kind of a wait and see mode. But for now, there's some genuine positives that I want to pass along to you that I'm hopeful about. Number one, it inspired a national, even international conversation. While this was happening, this was, it was all over the news, it was all over social media, it was about Jesus. Instead of a school shooting, a political argument, a race riot, a foreign war, or the latest weird thing Sam Smith decided to do. That counts for a lot. Number two is it was marked by humility. I would say the number one most often term I heard used describing the Asbury thing was the word humility. There are no celebrity preachers or worship leaders leading all of this. Jesus is the celebrity. And it's worth noting that American pastor and theologian Jonathan Edwards, who's second only in admiration to John Calvin within re Reformed churches, he has a book all about revivals asking how do we know the false from the true and he said the primary mark of a true revival is Christian love and the mark of Christian love is humility. It is a humble love. Number three, it was marked by authenticity. The vibe, you know, the place was mellow, loving, kind, open, gracious, authentic. You know, some are standing, some people are sitting, some are praying. It wasn't produced, it wasn't flashy, and frankly, it wasn't weird either. Number four, it was marked by unity. I, I saw all of it. You know, all ages were in the room when I was there, and it, it wasn't hard to pick up on the fact that you could tell people were from different backgrounds. Uh, when everyone was singing and worshiping together, there was something super refreshing about that. Number five, it was marked and catalyzed by young people. See, statistically speaking, Gen Z is the most unbelieving unchurched group in U.S. history. And that same generation is also dealing with record numbers of anxiety, discontent, depression, sexual confusion. I really believed before the Asbury thing happened that it was going to take something like that, like a new great awakening to flip that script. And I think we should be praying that this is just the beginning of something like that. And then finally, uh, something positive that came out for me was the fact that the criticisms that I've heard so far are pretty weak. I'm sure there will be deeper and more thought through criticism in the days to come, but I've heard everything from, well, they weren't using the King James only, to uh, because there was a demon cast out that shows it's not from God, which is a really, really strange thing if you've ever read the Bible. You see, but you can take it all in. You're not required to become a part of the Asbury Revival fan club and buy a t-shirt to be in on what God is doing. Revival comes through sincere, committed, passionate prayer and being open to what God is doing. And that's my counsel to all of us. Be inspired to do that. Pray uh, let's, and put yourself in a place where God can work in and through you. Hope that helps. See you next time.